Hi and welcome to another Hill Dickinson podcast. Um, my name is Mark Wheeler. I'm a legal director in the corporate and commercial team in the London office of Hill Dickinson. My role um, in this podcast is to cover the uh, exposure uh, in the fields of company and commercial to the extent that we practice in the London office uh, with respect to COVID-19. Um, as you'll be aware, Hill Dickinson is an international firm uh, and whilst the London team has significant exposure to the UK markets, we do operate on an international basis. So we're seeing the impact of COVID-19 to a lot of fields for our clients. Now, firstly, uh, as a underlying narrative or theme that should be flowing through all of my colleagues' podcasts, um, given that I've listened to and seen a number of them, is the concept of being proactive when assessing the impact of COVID-19. COVID-19 is expansive and it is going to create sizable um, changes in the way that we operate um, now and have previously operated. Um, to paraphrase uh, Donald Rumsfeld, there are things that we know we know, there are things that we no, we don't know. Uh, there is also things we don't know that we know, um, and there's things that we don't know that we don't know. The important statement I'm trying to make by paraphrasing Rumsfeld relatively poorly is that the best way of understanding the impact of COVID-19 is to explore how it may have ramifications on you. Now, whilst elements of this podcast series will deal with the contentious situations, this podcast is designed to deal with the elements which are commonly seen and are required to deal with on a operational corporate basis. Now, a key element of corporate and commercial considerations whilst identifying is what arrangements could be impacted by COVID-19. Now, you will have no doubt heard of the term material adverse change. And this is something that my colleague Diana has mentioned in detail in her podcast with respect to finance matters. But as a business term, it is also essential when considering your existing arrangements and also agreements that may be terminated or leveraged for restructuring both by yourself and your counterparty or counterparties. Now, there are a number of areas that could be affected by the impacts of the economic situation deriving from COVID-19. And also, as the impact is not just of an economic nature, it's also of a logistical nature, there could be elements which are not just financially st uh, stressed, but also from an infrastructure basis, they are stressed. So this podcast is designed to be a relatively high level summary. But in looking at some of the things which we are commonly seeing, a short list of some of the immediate issues and the ones which jump to my mind, I would break down into the following areas. Mergers and acquisitions, um, secondly, investments, thirdly, joint ventures, fourthly, um, existing um, distribution and supply arrangements, and the fifth being capital markets. Now, firstly, I turn to mergers and acquisitions. Now, there are a number of areas that these could be relevant. It depends on whether you are the buyer, uh, the seller, or some sort of related party involved in either the buyer or the seller. And there are a number of claims that may arise for the buyer and or the seller as a result of this deal. Now, some of the elements in the merger and acquisition documents could be performance related. So these could be performance conditions, which often relate to contingent milestones or something that we refer to, at least in English practice, as earn out. Um, if the target company um, is required to perform to a certain level uh, to provide the economic uh, outcome for the sellers, and by that I mean the purchase price, you've got to be thinking, are some of those performance conditions going to be met or should they be restructured? Because ultimately you want to make sure that you preserve the value of the target. Um, there are various points to consider and I'll turn to that in a second. The second will be <coughs> payment obligations, particularly on the buyer. Is there a likelihood that they will be defaulted or defaulted on? In which case, should the seller, if that's relevant to you, be entering into a discussion now? And similarly, if you're the buyer, should you be entering into a discussion with the seller to prevent there being a situation of a default, which can be remedied in some sort of restructuring manner, which is amenable to both parties? Um, a third might be the inability for future undertakings and or covenants um, to be enforceable, as they simply cannot be performed. 
Now each of these will have an impact on the effectiveness of the transaction, even if the transaction in terms of the transfer of a target has already happened. A major area may be the retention of key staff. If the earnout is payable in part to the key staff, maybe for example they were option holders, so they exercise their options on sale um, and they now are entitled to part of the purchase price. You might be asking yourself, what incentive do you have to keep them on board above their normal remuneration, so their salary package? And of course, with the salary, they may have already taken some sort of hit by virtue of a, a, a temporary or permanent pay cut. If you're the seller, you'll be worried about the default of the buyer. And if you're the buyer, you'll be worried about the preservation of the value of what you've purchased. So a key element here is look at your M&A documents, understand if you should be bringing a claim against the seller. Perhaps there might be a breach of warranty that you simply sat on because it didn't feel like it was necessary at the time. And also thinking about, are we preserving the value in the target? So fundamentally here, assess the deal terms and see whether they should be reviewed um, on a proactive basis. The M&A considerations also then flow into investments and, and by investments, I'm typ typically looking at equity or debt, inv debt investments into a company. And the question is, as an investor, is your investment at risk? Now this could be because the company, once again, has suffered a material adverse change and a material adverse may change may be a short or long-term economic impact on the performance of the company or business in question. Um, this may mean that an advance in the future is not payable. So if you're the target, if you're the company receiving the investment, you'll be concerned about the economic impact of a cash flow pinch. Um, the second point to then think about is if you're the investor, you know, are you experiencing monetary issues or could you experience monetary issues? Should you be approaching in advance of a default? It's not a good example, it, sorry, it's not a good example of business practice and something that Peter and also separately Diana cover in their podcast to simply close your eyes off to the future possibilities of financial difficulties. In terms of the investment, the performance of the investment agreement obligations or the investment documentation obligations can have an impact both on the working capital and also the future commitments of the company. This is obviously what we often refer to as the butterfly effect. A third area might be joint ventures. You could have established some form of partnership to develop a product or a service which is no longer viable by the direct or indirect impact of the company or your JV partner or partners of the, for um, the, the, the product or the service in question. It might just simply not be a good time to launch this product. Um, the general public demand for the product or service might not be there. It may be the case that the purpose is no longer viable. So should you be looking at the joint venture um, and putting it on either pause or permanently closing it? Or it might be that the product or service can continue to be used, but as a result of the changes of business practice or future implementation of services, such as in the leisure and tourism industry, that it's no longer profitable. So in light of the current economic climate, once again, very similar, pretty much identical to the M&A and the investment stuff, you should be assessing the documentation, understanding the covenants and undertakings, and taking this moment to say, just because we're involved in the joint venture, should we continue to be involved? And also thinking, as is often the case with the COVID-19, is how are my counterparties impacted? Should I be opening a dialogue in advance so that these sort of issues are not becoming mission critical fire issues because they arise at a point where we weren't anticipating them? A fourth area, and one that's going to be impacting a lot of business, is just simply the logistics of distribution and supply. You might look at some of your distribution, supply, and also to a degree agency agreements and ascertain whether they are actually relevant or applicable at the moment. Some distribution and supply agreements often have a minimum purchase order and you might be therefore subject to minimum purchases or minimum supply obligations regardless of the logistical and regulatory landscape arising from COVID-19. Now as we move away from uh, the severe lockdown that all these uh, the majority of countries have been experiencing during the phase one, um, and we await the impact of potential um, secondary waves in various countries, 
um, will be having to ascertain whether these sort of arrangements need to have additional grace periods or whether they are functionally reasonable. It could also be an occasion where you realise that distribution to certain areas is no longer actually as attractive as it used to be. Obviously, the UK, as an example, has recently been going through the continued um, elements of Brexit. Uh, and this might be an opportunity in conjunction with Brexit to ascertain the exposure to EU markets. The fifth area, and this is an area which um, the particularly our team in the London office, uh, but also our counterparts in um, the Manchester and Liverpool offices of um, Hill Dickinson, uh, experiences capital markets. Now, there's additional obligations if your company is listed or in a group that has a listed parent company. Um, and these include announcements to the market, uh, disclosures of material um, elements that would impact um, the interest of shareholders in the company as a whole. Now, I won't go into great detail on that. It is a very comprehensive area. But one of the things is, if it is relevant to you, speak to your corporate advisor, um, speak to your legal advisors, and bring your particular points to them, because it's better to be proactive um, on these. Um, a failure to disclose can be something that could lead to suspension or some other form of steps um, against you. Now, companies as I think I'm hopefully making clear here, should be taking the time to identify the areas of risk and considering how they should be revisited and potentially revised to factor in the current economic climate. This may be by performing a master, uh, perform, uh, sorry, this may be by extending performance milestones or changing the deliverables or undertakings to make them workable. It may be the case that debts need to be restructured or interest for option holders or third parties need to be reviewed. Potentially, in the situation of the earnouts where I was talking about the M&A and key staff, you might be wanting to think about further shares or share options being offered. This is also relevant potentially consultants or uh, key um, third parties who are involved in the furtherance of your business. That said, there may be arrangements which the parties need to consider should fall away. Whilst this will have potentially immediate cost implications when considering the forecast of the business, it may be better for the long-term solvency of the operations and viability for those drastic cuts to be taken. Now, we all want to go back to normal life and we all hope that the economy will recover in the V-shape, as many of the political establishments have been saying. But it is a reality that hard decisions may need to be taken. And some of these hard decisions may have been uh, paused for an extended period of time, hoping that continued growth leads to a necessity for these cuts to fall away. Well, the reality is we are moving in to a new normal. And I think a key factor when reviewing these elements is considering the solvency of the business. And by solvency, it's not just for about today, it's also for the next 12 months and beyond. If the company is deemed insolvent, the director's duty shift. As Peter's, as Peter's podcast uh, explains in very good detail, whilst the company is solvent, the directors will generally act in the best interest of the company and its shareholders, whilst ensuring that the company delivers on its obligations under the uh, various arrangements and agreements it has in place. When a company is deemed to become insolvent, the directors have to act in the best interest of the creditors. As a result, the interests of an economic return to the shareholders completely shifts to being an economic return to the creditors, and that being the people that the company owes debt to. As this line is quite fluid, it's essential that the directors take prudent steps before existing insolvency becomes an issue, because the main driver, the main driver behind decisions that they will need to take will shift. If you can be proactive, and it's very important to demonstrate you've been proactive, Keep relevant records, board minutes, resolutions, board packs, etc. But if you can be proactive and take steps that are endeavoured to restructure the business or operations to retain solvency and viability, then ultimately you are acting in the best interest not only of the company, but also of its key stakeholders. As I say, this is quite a lot to cover. Um, in one podcast. Uh, we do have a lot of literature on our website, so please um, do review that. Um, either get in touch with Rosie or myself. My name's Mark Wheeler, as I said, and my details will be on the website uh, and also for this podcast. And I hope um, that both yourself, your operations, and everyone that you're involved with remain safe and well during COVID-19. 
um, we will get through this, um, not to sound too much like uh, our uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, but we will get through this. And hopefully as we enter into the new normal, it will be one that is very successful for both you and all of those that are connected with you. Many thanks. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this podcast. By way of introduction, I'm Peter Spate, an associate in the restructuring and insolvency team at the Manchester office here at Hill Dickinson. As would have been mentioned by my colleagues in their podcasts, COVID-19 has had an impact on businesses globally and certainly in respect of their respective solvencies. As a result, shareholders, directors, suppliers and creditors alike need to be mindful that the current market conditions are extremely uncertain and we all need to be aware of potential insolvency related events so we can best protect ourselves. Restructuring insolvency is a broad area uh, and one which you may already be familiar with, but for those that haven't, I do intend to cover a few of the key points first uh, before discussing the recent legis legislative changes brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. So turning to restructuring insolvency in a very general term, uh, and as I believe my colleague Mark has previously touched on, the potential actual insolvency of a company registered in England and Wales shifts its director's duties away from the company and its shareholders to focus purely on the company's creditors. The rationale for this is that in circumstances where a company is insolvent, the assets belong in a practical sense to the creditors and therefore they need to be protected to achieve the best returns possible. The sorts of insolvency events you may already be familiar with, uh, company voluntary arrangements, administrations and liquidations. Once a company enters one of these insolvency processes, an insolvency practitioner, which I'll refer to throughout this as an IP, it appointed to review the affairs of the company and where possible identify and gather in all the company's assets to try and return as much money to its creditors as possible. It is at this point that restrictions are placed on a creditor's ability to enforce their rights of recovery for any sums due or assets held by the company. As a result of this, companies, directors, suppliers and creditors all need to be aware that when a company is faced with the prospect of insolvency, they should be taking appropriate proactive action to protect their, petition, their positions before the company enters that insolvency process. And therefore it's important for people to understand exactly what will trigger an insolvency process. And there are two main ways of testing whether a company is insolvent. The first one is whether it's unable to pay its debts as they fall due, and this is more widely known as cash flow insolvent. And the second is whether the value of the company's assets are less than the amount of its liability. This is known as balance sheet insolvent. If either or both of these factors are present, then the company, its directors or its suppliers, as the creditors may consider instigating an insolvency process. It is at this point that the director's obligations shift from the company and its shareholders to its creditors. If a director fails to carry out any of his duties to the company's creditors at a time of insolvency, the consequences for that director can be extremely serious, as they may be personally liable for the losses the company has suffered and even face disqualification from acting as a director. It is there of therefore of fundamental importance that directors seek advice as soon as they come up, become aware or suspect that the company faces insolvency. Furthermore, if the director fails to discharge their duties, it may result in an IP taking claims against them or third party recipients of the company's assets. This is in an effort to try to restore, compensate the company for its losses caused by the director's breaches. Whilst this may result in returns for the creditors to maximise their positions, it is a lengthy and expensive process, often taking years to resolve. As a result, suppliers, partners and agents of the respective insolvent companies should be looking to protect themselves well before the threat of insolvency looms 
through properly prepared supply contracts which contain appropriate guarantees, termination clauses and, and or retention of title clauses. Properly drafted and incorporated clauses will allow us to enter upon the buyer's premises and retake possession of any goods supplied, even in the event of insolvency. Acted upon quickly enough, we can prevent goods subject to these clauses from being sold as an asset of the insolvent company and the proceeds distributed between all of the company's creditors. Instead, the goods will be returned to the supplier to be redistributed as the supplier sees fit. For example, I worked alongside Rosie to assist one of her Lithuanian clients. In this circumstance, Rosie's client supplied goods to a company registered in operation in England and Wales. The, sub the company sub subsequently went into administration and was holding a large amount of goods, which were still to be fully paid for. Rosie's client also had further sums owed to it for other unpaid goods supplied. There were retention of title clauses drafted into their terms and conditions, and as they contacted us immediately on the insolvency event, through the proper submissions, we were able to recover all the goods supplied and these were returned to Rosie's clients, minimising the loss suffered. It's therefore fundamentally important for all parties to be aware of what constitutes an insolvent event, consider the accounting position of the company appropriately, and take necessary proactive steps, as I'm sure my other colleagues have asserted, especially in light of the current coronavirus pandemic. The current coronavirus pandemic has caused a loss of companies to be either both balance sheet or cash flow insolvent. The UK government has identified a significant risk to its economy if companies are placed into insolvency processes. As a result, they have released the new Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill. The bill's main aim is to provide companies with additional tools and breathing space to see them through their current financial difficulties and designed to provide short-term relief from the effects of coronavirus. The first thing to note is the bill deals with both temporary measures that are necessary and linked to the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as permanent measures attending to assist companies in the future. The temporary measures that you will no doubt you may have heard of uh, are the relaxing of wrongful trading against directors. Wrongful trading is uh, when a director has been trading with whilst the company is insolvent and has worsened the position for the company's creditors. In pre-COVID times, a director could be found liable for the increase in creditors' liability from the point of insolvency to the point of an insolvency process was instigated and an IP appointed. The bill will reduce this liability and will assume that the director is not responsible for the worsening of the financial position of the company or the creditor position throughout that relevant period. The next temporary change is statutory demands and winding up petitions, which may be of most relevance uh, to you out there. Uh, these are actions taken by creditors to place a company into liquidation. And the intention of the bill is to allow companies breathing space and prevent the threat of winding up proceedings being used as an aggressive debt collection tool. The bill now requires creditors to prove that the debt to which they're wishing to prosecute has not been caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The final temporary measure is around corporate governance and allows the Secretary of State the power to make further regulations to help companies initiate insolvency proceedings to obtain protection from any aggressive creditors. Overall, these changes in relation to corporate governance are only intended to have a six month lifespan. Turning to the permanent measures, there's the introduction of a new restructuring moratorium, which is to designed to sit alongside the current administration regime and provide a lighter touch approach to give companies breathing space by restricting creditors from enforcing recovery proceedings and allow the company to be rescued as a going concern. And sitting alongside this will be a new restructuring plan which is designed to aid the already discussed moratorium and sets out a procedure for formulating a binding restructuring plan during the moratorium 
to aid the company's rescue. Finally, the bill has sought to amend termination clauses within contracts. The intention behind this amendment is to ensure continuity of supply and therefore encourage and allow companies more of a chance to rescue their business. The termination clauses that would usually be triggered on the insolvency of a company in contracts for the supply of goods and services will cease to have effect if the company becomes subject to an insolvency procedure, as I have mentioned previously. Counterparties will still be able to terminate contracts, but for other types of breach, if permitted by the contracts. Therefore, important that all suppliers review their terms and conditions appropriately, taking any action. This has only been a whistle-stop tour of some of the key aspects of the current insolvency regime and what the new bill will amend. I do hope this has been of some assistance, and obviously if you need any further assistance, please don't hesitate to ask, or you can access further information through our COVID-19 hub, which Rosie will provide details of. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope you all the best in these difficult circumstances, and that you all stay safe. This is Rosie again, and I will finish today's podcast with a short talk about the issues that transport and travel industries are facing due to COVID-19. We assist our clients with regard to various issues in relation to road, sea and air transportation. Given the delays and disruption owing to COVID-19, there are many logistic companies whose businesses are being adversely affected and who may struggle to honor their contractual obligations. During the recent months, many countries had to implement the prohibition of cross-border travel and social distancing measures. As the disruption to international trade and shipping caused by the outbreak of COVID-19 continues, the financial pressure on the transport companies is rising due to the impact of delays and quarantine measures that may be imposed on road vehicles, vessels and aircrafts. Without any doubt, the air travel was most adversely affected. This industry is facing a drastic reduction of fleets, staff cuts, accelerated closure of unprofitable subsidiaries, adjustments to security measures and sluggish demand. Even before the outbreak, the air travel industry in the UK was struggling and small budget airlines were forced to close down and sell their fleets. Recent media reports seem to suggest that there is an increased risk of respiratory and gastrointestinal diseases on ships. The quarantine that of many cruise vessels is a good example of what could happen in circumstances where port authorities suspect that a vessel may be carrying crew or people infected by COVID-19. Crew and passengers may be exposed to protracted periods of confinement on board, owing both to delays at the port or any quarantine measures which the port may impose. Therefore, the cruise and passenger industries have to take extra measures to secure passenger crew safety. Such means that ships must be fitted with onboard medical facilities with shipboard medical professionals available around the clock which no doubt results in higher operating costs to the logistic companies. There are potential cargo claims. Transportation companies and suppliers may find themselves unable to deliver goods to destinations. Commercial losses may also be incurred due to cancellations of the usual road, air or shipping routes, delays in discharge and transshipment costs. Significant delay increases businesses' exposure to claims for loss in the financial value of the cargo and for cargo damage, particularly if the cargo is perishable, like food products. Delays to quarantine or temporary cancellation of usual shipping routes mean that containers are either stranded on board ships, offloaded in alternate locations, or sitting in the various ports and terminals incurring port storage fees and other contractual penalties. Performance of many sale and purchase contracts were affected. The value of certain commodities dropped sharply due to a reduced demand. 
This is most evident in the increasing crude oil price for fluctuations, where the extraction of oil can be more expensive than the price one can sell it for. Price for stemmed from crude supply exceeding storage space at the key physical delivery points. Therefore, during the recent months we have seen many tanker vessels being used as floating storage vessels until energy demand increases. This creates certain legal issues in itself, as the usual contractual provisions might not deal with all issues. In practice, long storage may result in cargo damage, contamination or shortage disputes. Not only delivery channels are affected, but also the financial health of many companies. I have recently assisted to several Lithuanian manufacturers and suppliers who sell their products in the UK and therefore the British bars often require that English law should apply to their contracts or terms and conditions. My colleague Peter from restructuring team has already told you how we assisted my Lithuanian clients on an urgent bankruptcy matter. Together with Peter and his team, we have stopped sale of the goods and subsequently recovered the unsold goods which were returned to the Lithuanian clients. In such a way, the Lithuanian clients significantly reduced their loss and only a small fraction remained unpaid, which will be claimed in the usual bankruptcy proceedings. However, the most frequent problem for the suppliers is failure to receive payment from the foreign buyers for the goods already supplied. It is often impossible to establish as to whether your counterparty truly suffers of financial problems or if the counterparty simply decides to delay payments hiding behind an excuse of COVID-19. Most recently, I have assisted a large Lithuanian clothing manufacturer that delivered several consignments of goods to the well-known large retailer in the UK. The retailer, in breach of their contractual obligations, failed to pay for several months. After I was instructed and contacted the retailer, it had blamed the store's closure for their failure to pay. After I have pointed out that their online business appears to be booming, the payment plan was successfully agreed with the Lithuanian manufacturer. Therefore, act promptly and do not delay seeking legal advice if and when required. My colleagues Sarah and Laura have prepared an article containing helpful tips for travel industry, which you can find on our website. I will briefly highlight some key points to keep in mind. Please follow the Foreign Commonwealth Office advice in relation to travel, which could be subject to change at any time. Travelers are unlikely to have a contractual right to cancel or rebook their holiday, even when traveling to countries affected by coronavirus, and there are many, unless the FCO prohibit travel to those areas. Normal cancellation charges will therefore apply. However, where the FCO advises against all but essential travel to a particular destination, the traveller will be able to cancel their holiday for a free or rebook for free without incurring any cancellation charges. Although some countries reported reduced court services, in England and Wales we see very few disruptions in this regard. Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunals Service has stated that the business of our courts and tribunals continues. We are currently not aware of any court hearings being cancelled or rescheduled because of coronavirus. Indeed, the courts and tribunals successfully operate through the use of audio or video links in appropriate circumstances. This also means that individuals who who may have to self-isolate will still be able to participate in hearings. I have reached the end of our podcast. I am very grateful to my colleagues for their readiness to assist and their time devoted to preparing their informative presentations. I hope you will find them useful. If you have any further questions or require any specific legal advice, please do not hesitate to contact us. 
Please note that there is lots of helpful information provided on our firm's website in the dedicated COVID-19 hub. You will see the link to the hub on this last slide. Thank you for listening. Dar kartą dėkoju jums už pateiktus klausimus ir LCLC už suteikta galimybę. Best wishes from Rosie and Hill Dickinson team.